You know, love makes you do some crazy things. I remember when I was in junior high, I had a friend, uh, because he doesn't, didn't have a car yet, uh, he would ride his bike over highway traffic for almost two hours to visit a special someone that he really liked because she had a cold, bringing, him, bringing her uh, orange juice and some cough medicine. And when he told me that, and he told me the route that he took over the highway, I was like, man, you're crazy. And I also know of another person who covered his girlfriend's room with thousands of rose petals. And it took him hours to take it all by himself. And also the, ha- the hallway leading to her room had two rows of candles just because it was her birthday. That's crazy too. Uh, I have friends who I know who planned on renting their own private airplane when I was in Chicago during our high school years uh, to do something extra special beyond all the other couples to really make their uh, girlfriends feel special. They were going to rent a private plane, fly it from Chicago to Florida so that for the post-prom they could go to Walt Disney World. That is crazy. And if you think about most engagements, uh, poor college students or those who just got their jobs, not a lot of money even for a car, and they spend thousands of dollars on all things a diamond. Very practical, right? To give to a girl hoping to hear one word, yes. That's crazy, but that's love. And we do crazy things for people when we're in love. We'll give up sleep. We'll gladly surrender money at all costs. We'll give up our best friends whom we've known since uh, first grade. Because when you're in love with someone, that person is everything to you. You're captivated by their eyes. You can't gaze into them long enough. And when you're apart, you have to keep staring at their photos. You love hearing their voice. You spend hours on the phone with them. And you love just being with them. And that's what we call being in love. And some might argue, Eddie, aren't you just talking about infatuation? Well, so I anticipated that, so I looked up definitions of both infatuation and love. Infatuation is defined as a foolish, unreasoning, or extravagant passion or attraction. That's not too bad, but one that is short-lived. And love was defined as a profound, tender, passionate affection for another person. And when I was doing a side-by-side comparison, I realized both infatuation and love had so many of the similar adjectives describing them. Now, looking at both definitions, they were almost the same except for the time frame in which love was to last while infatuation didn't. Love and infatuation are both foolish, unreasoning, extravagant, passionate, and affectionate. But when it fades, we label it as a fad or he was just infatuated. It wasn't real love. If that's the case, We could argue most marriages were the results of infatuation and not the true definition of love, with almost 60% uh, being the key number now for divorces in America, and Korea is not too far behind, sadly. Uh, We realize and we have to wonder, was it love? They all started with passion and excitement, but it didn't last. So by definition, was it love? Even the Bible tells us that love never fails. It doesn't die. It does not fade. And now Korean guys especially have a great reputation of being romantic. Now wait for the qualifier. During the dating years. Dramas glamorize them. Young men imitate them. And other Asian women flock to Korea to find them. And for guys, it's oftentimes about the chase, the challenge. 
Can I win her heart? And marriage oftentimes is the closing medal ceremony of achieving that goal. I have won her heart. It is finished. But sadly, for women, the wedding day is the opening ceremony of a lifetime of dreaming, of being lavished with that romantic, sacrificial, generous love. And on that wedding day, with the guys thinking, you mean you expected me to keep doing that after we're married? And with the girls thinking, you mean the you that you were showing me isn't the you that I'll be married to forever? And so the honeymoon begins. Now you might be thinking, dude, come on, Eddie. What's up with all this marriage talk? I thought we are going through the book of Revelation. Well, you know what? That's what this book is about. It is about the great wedding that will happen between Christ and his bride, the church. This amazing book is about a love relationship that Jesus Christ has with his bride, the church. And the book concludes, as we will see later on, with the great wedding feast, when we will be united with Christ for all eternity. And today, we're going to see the first of seven letters to those churches in those cities that we talked about before. And we might even call them love letters to some degree. And we're going to see the heart of God longing to see that love restored. Now, I invite you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. And this portion begins with Jesus' letter to the church in Ephesus. Now, this church was on fire for God in the beginning. Uh, and it was one of the most powerful cities during the Roman Empire. Actually, it was one of the four most powerful cities during that time period. Very influential, both in economy and also spirituality. There was a major trade route that went through this uh, city that brought thousands of people from around surrounding countries through this city. Uh, but also, it was a major cult center uh, that was established there uh, to the temple of Diana, or what's also called, called Artemis, who was a fertility goddess. So with thousands of prostitutes uh, waiting to receive visitors, made it another reason for people to come through this area. But Paul and his disciples, Priscilla and Aquila, brought the gospel here, and it spread like crazy. And uh, they're the ones who ended up starting this church here. And in this influential, powerful city, God was raising up an influential and powerful church. They were passionate about the lost. They loved the people of their city. Those in Ephesus, they would reach out to the lost, and the church was growing. But several decades later, as the believers, the first generation believers and second generation, as they were growing up in their faith and gaining more knowledge, they discovered something, and they discovered that, you know what? Non-Christians can be kind of difficult. Uh, they can be kind of annoying. They don't get the theology quite as quick as we want them to, and they kind of slow us down from really being the church. And just like far too many marriages, the passionate love relationship that they once had with Christ and His people and the lost began to dwindle down to a duty-oriented partnership. And Jesus wants to address that. So follow along with me in your outlines today. We want to see what Jesus writes in this love letter to his bride, to his church in Ephesus. But also, I believe that this letter is very practical for us, the church of God here in this city as well. So the first part of this letter reveals that God knows our deeds. So everyone repeat, God knows our deeds. So he knows what's going on. He knows what we are doing. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2, starting from verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, 
The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And you may recall, now we're hearing echoes of how Jesus described himself uh, in the end of chapter 1. And he will be introducing these elements again in the beginning of these letters. So the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and it's basically saying, Dear Ephesus, this is Jesus, the one who is in control of all things, and the one who walks among you. As we looked at that last week, Jesus is with us. He walks among the lampstands, the churches. So he knows what's going on. Just wanted to let you know that, verse 2, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. He's saying, I know your deeds, I know your hard service, and I know that you have been passionate about sound truth and correct theology. Their commitment to orthodoxy was unparalleled. It was strong. And one thing we can learn is that we too should be strong in our theology and in our understanding. We too must know our doctrine well. So read good theology. Read Jonathan Edwards. Read J.I. Packer. Read systematic theology, biblical theology. We should be growing in this capacity. And this church, as they loved the truth, as they loved guarding the truth, they tested people who claimed to be apostles, who claimed to be leaders, and they were so thorough in their knowledge of doctrine and theology, they were able to discover these are false teachers. And Jesus is saying, I commend you for that. I know the hard service that you've been to. I know your love for truth, and that is awesome. And so Jesus is encouraging them. Verse 3, I know that you are enduring patiently. He's saying, I know you're going through hard times, but you're keeping on and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. He's saying, I know you've been through a hard time, and I appreciate that you've been doing that for my name's sake. That is our God. He knows. Other people may not notice you or appreciate you, but God does. He knows that life's been hard, and that is the kind of lover Jesus is towards us. He loves looking at you. He loves watching you. He loves taking notes on everything that you are doing. And he knows what you've been through. Every rejection, every misunderstanding, every hurt in your heart, every pain that you carry, and every regret that you wish so much you could go back in time and redo. And even when you feel all alone and everybody else has moved on, he's saying, I know. I know what you've been through. I know the pain in your heart, and you're not alone. You're not forgotten. I know, and I care. That is the kind of God we serve. Amen? So you're not forgotten. So that's good news, that in the midst of all of our lives, even when we feel so alone, God is there. God knows. He knows the depths of our being. So that's good news. God knows our deeds, but also... God knows our hearts. So everyone repeat. God knows our hearts. Let's look at verse 4. He says, but I have this against you. So I know all the hard work you've been doing. I know you've been faithful for decades and years. But I have something against you. And that is that you have abandoned the love you had at first. And some translations say you have left your first love. Now, God knows what we've done, but he also knows the heart behind it. He knows when we go through the motions, and he knows when our heart really isn't there. But what does it mean when he says, you have abandoned the love that you had at first, or you have lo lost your first love? Some commentators say it means you have left the first passionate love you had for God when you first knew him. Other commentators say, uh, no, it means they have lost their first original love, the passion they had for Christians, for other believers. Uh, as time went on, they started caring more about truth than for people. And I actually think it can be both. 
because God never separates our love for him and our love for one another. Look at the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor. God connects the two. And also in 1 John, as also 2 John and 3 John, the same author, I believe, as the author of this book of Revelation, he also often would connect the two loves. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 and following says, We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. It's always connected. Amen? Another reason why I believe it to be, mean both is also if we look at John chapter 21, so again, same author, uh, same John, and as he's writing the account of Jesus and Peter, and as you remember, Peter denied Christ three times, and later on they meet together, they're having breakfast, they're eating fish, and Jesus asks Peter a question. Hey, Peter, do you love me? And what does Peter reply? Uh, Jesus, yes, you know that I love you. Second time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you, you know all things. You know I love you. Peter, one more question for you. Do you love me? And Peter, heartbroken that Jesus asked a third time, do you love me? He said, Jesus, you know all. You know my heart. You know I love you. After each response, Jesus doesn't say, I love you too, buddy. He says, after he hears, Peter says, Jesus, I love you. What does Jesus say? Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Jesus himself connects love for him with serving and loving his people. Amen? And so we see the heart of God behind the heart of this beloved disciple, John, as he writes all these instances connecting these two, our love for God and each other. But what John 21 also teaches us is that it is good. We should examine our love for Christ on a regular basis. Do I really love Jesus? Do I still love him as I did before? Another meaning of this first love that is all argued by G.K. Beale in his uh, New Testament commentary, he says, this concept of first love is also connected not just to our love for God, not just our love for the church, but also our love for the lost, especially for missions. And where does he get this? Look at Matthew 24, starting from verse 12. I provided it for you in your outline. He says, and because lawlessness will be increased, because there'll be uh, more Christians surrounding you, because you'll see less people caring about the things of God, because things may get harder, the love of many will grow cold towards them, towards other people, towards the lost. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved, meaning the truly saved, the truly elect will not let this love just fade away and die, but the truly saved will keep their heart burning for God, for his church, but especially the lost. How do we make that connection? Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so we see in this all three facets of what we are talking about. So as lawlessness increase, some, their hearts will grow colder towards others. It's too hard. We got to protect the truth. It's too, let's keep these non-Christians outside the truth, outside the church, right? So let, let's keep them outside. And the love of many will grow cold. But those who are truly saved, the elect, will endure till the end. Their hearts will not grow cold. And then he says, in this gospel, they will bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. And he connects it with Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 says, once again, he, Jesus, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. 
So this message to them is connected to their function as lampstands, which is lights, being lights through your gospel. Jump down to verse 5 in Revelation 2. Repent, if not, I will come to you and remove your what? Your lampstand, your place of influence. So he connects our love for God and our love for the lost. Because you will always love talking about the things you love. Right? It shows that it has a deep place in your heart. Like for me, it's easy to talk about NFL football or the Dallas Cowboys. Like easy. You want to start? I could just go on and on, right? It's easy to talk about the music of you two. I could tell you the spiritual history of this band and each member. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy. And when Jesus is our first love, he's saying that there is great joy and delight in him, but also to share him. And that is one thing I love about this church of Onity, that it has at its heartbeat this vision of being the Acts 29 church, that missions is at its core, that its desire, the heartbeat of this church, since it was conceived 25 years ago this year, was to see all the nations know the person and the name of Jesus Christ. And I believe that is why God has blessed this church so much. Of course, it's not perfect. But I think God loves this church so much because it loves the things that God loves. And that is to see all the nations know him, love him. You see, there's a direct connection between our love for Christ and our involvement in missions and evangelism. There's a direct correlation. God knows our hearts. And when he desires, what he desires in our relationship with him is not people who are duty, duty, duty driven, but when love comes first in our relationship with him. Before it's duty, he wants it because of love. Why are you serving? Why did you do this? I have to. Versus, I love God. That's why I'm serving in this capacity. That before you say, it's because of sacrifice. Okay, I guess I'll have to sacrifice again. No, he wants people to serve him because of love. God says, I know that you have left the love that you had at first. This reveals a very scary reality, that we could love God's truth. We could be faithful in our service to God for decades. We could even be sacrificial in what we give to God, what we do for God, yet our hearts can be growing cold towards God. That's what happened to the church in Ephesus. They were faithful for decades. They loved truth. They were really good in theology and doctrine. But despite all that, their heart was growing colder. Showing up for duty doesn't mean that we delight being there. God doesn't want people who go through the motions. He wants delights and devotion. He doesn't just want workers, people of God. You might be thinking, all right, Eddie, you've Convinced me, I guess I'll sign up and be a small group leader. I'll do this for God, okay. He does not want workers. He wants worshipers. He doesn't need more laborers. All right, I'll do this. He wants more lovers. Amen? He wants worshipers where the reason you do it all is because of him. Not for a title, not for respect from other people, not to look good in front of other people's eyes, but because you love Jesus Christ. Because true worship to him and true service to him is when love is first. Everyone repeat, when love is first. That's what God desires where the motive behind it is because love is first. That's the first motive. That's the first reason. When love for Jesus is first. Is our service and our walk with Christ marked more with duty or delight? Is your heart still in love with Jesus? You see, God knows our deeds. He knows that you've been faithfully attending. You don't miss a Sunday, even when you travel. He knows all the duty that we have served him with. 
but he also knows the heart behind it. And what God longs for is the heart that leads the way. Amen? And that is what I long for us. That is what I long for you. That you will not be like the older son of the prodigal son who was diligently serving, slaving, thinking that now God owes me something because of all I did for Him. We look to the cross and we look at the amazing sacrifice that Jesus paid for us. We didn't deserve it. Nothing was earned on our part. And yet because of His unfathomable love for us, He bought us. He paid the penalty for our sin. He took our wrath. And when we look to Jesus and we see that love on display, we are like, Jesus, thank you for that love. And we respond with, I love you and I thank you all my life. Not because, okay, I guess God, Jesus gave me his life. I guess I got to give him mine. That's nice. Not really. Because he wants your heart. And that's tough because the older we get, the longer we're Christians, uh, we become so much like the church in Ephesus. We get more comfortable with our Christian community. Oh, it takes too much effort to relate to these people. Oh, my goodness. And then we start becoming inclusive. And our hearts begin focusing on ourselves. I did this, all right, I did this for God, okay, God, owes, uh, God should be happy now. And we lose the passion we once had. But despite the fact that God knows all our deeds, He knows our hearts, there's a reason why He wants our hearts, and that is this, because God wants to shine through our lives. Everyone repeat, God wants to shine through our lives. Because when love is first, that love shines through. True love that is directed at something makes that thing look good and brings it honor. For example, if you hear someone say, oh my goodness, you have to see this movie. It is an amazing movie. Awesome movie, the best movie I've ever seen. And then you start hearing other people say the same thing. Uh, you're drawn to this movie. Right? Even though you didn't see it, you want to see this. And you have a favorable view Towards this movie. Or if you say, oh my goodness, this guy is the best cook, amazing cook, you have to taste it. And when you meet him, oh, you have a favorable view because this person, as we praise this person's cooking ability, it brings him honor. We are honoring this person. And when we say to this world, knowing Jesus is amazing, the peace and the joy that comes from him no matter the difficulties and suffering this world brings, there is something that Jesus brings that makes my heart sing. And when we say that to the world, that makes Christ look good. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, God doesn't need my help. I can't really make him look good. Well, no, he doesn't. He doesn't need your help. But there are plenty of times that we make him look bad. Amen? And so... I believe it's time for us to, again, realize that we rep represent the life and the light of Christ. And He wants to shine through you. That is why He doesn't want to see slavery. Right? He doesn't want to see all duty and slavery. He wants to see lovers, worshipers, that will shine the light of Christ. Amen? See, another sign of being in love is the interest of their hearts become the interest of your heart. So if you love someone, the natural tendency is you want to be involved with the things that they love. I remember when I uh, first started dating my wife, she was doing her master's degree in uh, immunology, like microbiology and all this stuff like that. And so I bought a microbiology book uh, because, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to know what she's thinking throughout the week. And I have, the first paragraph is hard. <laughs> All these definitions, I was like, oh my goodness. Um, and so, but she appreciated it, even though I could never finish that book. Uh, because 
Because I loved her, I wanted to know the things that were going on in her life, the things that she was studying, the things that were consuming her life. And God is saying to the Ephesian church, I miss when you used to love the people I loved, the lost in your city, those who needed the gospel. I miss those days. That's what Jesus is writing to them. You used to be so passionate about sharing the truth with the lost. Now you just love truth and tell others to get lost. So what are we to do? How can we rekindle our flame for Jesus again? I think we need to approach it the same way we do any relationship. Verse 5 it says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Look at how different things are now. Repent and do the works you did at first. There are three practical things that he's telling us to do in this verse. And that is to remember, repent, and do. So everyone repeat. Remember. Repent and do. Okay, so remembering how things used to be is not only nostalgic for our minds, it's good for our hearts and our emotions. Remembering how things used to be. For example, my wife and I, we love talking about the things that we did when we dated and also whenever we can to revisit those places, like restaurants that we would go to. Like when we're in, uh, you know, eating at like an Italian restaurant, we would talk about the Italian restaurant that we always went to when we were dating, just for that particular dish. And it would bring us back to those moments, those times. And neither of us are really into video games, uh, but when we were dating, uh, oftentimes before or after a movie, we would go to the arcade that was right next to it. And there was one game, and I'm too embarrassed to say it, so I'm not going to say it right now, uh, that we would always play. All right. All right, just too many people asked last service. All right, it was Jurassic Park. Right? That's why it was so embarrassing. We would shoot these dinosaurs for like, and we finally, we actually cleared the whole game one time. We were so happy. Uh, but when we, like, so every once in a while we'll see an arcade and we'll try to see, is that game there? And they don't have it anymore. I think, like the dinosaurs, they went extinct, right? Um, but also we would, uh, you know, we love talking about the places that we went to. And uh, during our break a couple months ago, we visited some of the places that we used to go to. And one fond memory that I have, that I thought she had as well, uh, is I introduced her to crabs, uh, like the long-legged crabs, because uh, that used to be my favorite dish. And so I wanted to introduce it to her. So I took her to this place, this city south in Korea that is famous for them, Young Duck. And so I would buy a whole bunch, and I you know, picked her up, we bought it, and then I took her to this beach side, because it's next to the beach. And uh, I loved it. You know, she was enjoying it, and now she loves crabs too. And I always had fond memories. And later on, you know, as we were talking about, again, we're reminiscing about our past times, and I um, have such fond memories. I thought it was so romantic of me, you know, bought to introduce this new delicious food and eating it on the beach. I was like, wasn't that awesome? She goes, honestly, Eddie, uh, the crabs were really good, but all I could remember from that day was all the flies that I had to keep fighting away. I was really? There were flies there? Really? But remembering those times also brings back the emotions. And one of my favorite memories of all, of our dating time period, is when I would pick her up from her dorm and seeing the excitement in her eyes because she didn't know where I was going to take her for our date for this week. And when, sometimes when I would just pick her up from work or drop her off or things like that, and she's next to me, those memories would come back when I used to pick her up when we were dating. And that's good for, not only for the mind, but that is good for the heart and for the soul. To remember the love, the feelings, the emotions, the passions that we had. Amen. And the same goes true for us and Jesus. He is saying, remember when you first met me? Remember when we first met and you were so excited to show up for service that Sundays didn't come fast enough? Remember that? Remember when you used to be so excited to talk about me to your friends? It's like, I, I remember that. I miss that. You know, um, 
I shared my testimony, the long version, when I first came to uh, OEM a couple years back at our retreat. And I think it's safe to say the majority of you guys probably weren't there. Uh, I want to show, share just a very fast-forward version of what happened when I met Christ. Uh, it kind of started, you know, I grew up in the church but didn't really know Christ yet on a personal level. It started in sixth grade. And my um, class, some, a couple of my classmates are also, also Christians, so sometimes I would talk about church. And in sixth grade, God gave me a sudden desire to read through the whole Bible. Um, and so I remember sitting at my desk, and, all right, I'm going to read through the whole Bible. And you, you know how it goes, right? Genesis was okay. Exodus, not too bad. Leviticus, ooh, man. And when I got to Numbers, I was like, let me start with the New Testament first. And I get to Matthew, and you know, Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy. I was like, oh boy. But then eventually, you know, I got into the swing of things. I went to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then I went to John. Especially John 3, when Nicodemus approaches Jesus at night and says, you know, how, how does somebody get to heaven, right? Because uh, he's a religious leader. He should know all these things. He's, how does a person get to heaven? And Jesus says, unless a man is born again, no one can enter the kingdom of God. And that bothered me. I was like, what does that mean? I don't know what being born again means. And I was thinking in my sixth grade mind, if I don't know what it means, chances are I'm not it. And if I'm not it, I'm going to hell. And I was like, oh, that's not good. And so I, the next day, you know, I was, this was a dilemma. And I was like, how, what's born again? And so I asked one of my classmates, who I knew also faithfully went to church, and I go, hey, hey, Steph, um, I was reading the Bible yesterday. What does it mean to be born again? And she looks at me and goes, oh, you don't know? And she ran away. I was traumatized because I've never been, one, number one, that rejected before. But also, I was thinking, because of her extreme reaction, I was thinking, maybe everybody knows except me. I'm thinking, maybe it's so obvious, I'm hellbound. You know? So I was so scared. I was so scared because of her extreme reaction. If she would have simply said, I don't know, I would have asked somebody else, like my pastor at church or something. But because she was, you don't know, and she ran, oh my gosh. I was like, no way am I asking anybody ever again. There's no way I'm asking my pastor. He's going to be like, you hell-bound sinner, you know. You don't know, you're not born again. And I would have these nightmares. So fast forward, um, I don't know, maybe one day I'll share the expanded version. But fast forward, I'm, into, I'm in youth group now. And we go to our, my very first youth group retreat. And the first thing that happens, we go on a hike and I break my collarbone. I'm like, gee, this is great, right? Uh, so the only thing I could participate in are the worship services. And, but throughout that time, I've been haunted for a year now. Over a year, I've been haunted by that phrase, born again. And then the last night of the retreat, the speaker preaches. That his title was, How to Be Born Again. And all of a sudden, I was like, ding. I was like paying attention. And I'm paying attention. Right? And at the end of the service, when he gave an altar call, he's like, if anyone would like to be born again, I like raised both my hands. I was like, me, 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 me. You know? I was like, I've been waiting for this. But remember, uh, my collarbone was broken. And so he, the preacher was like, let's have all the uh, counselors and pastors, and let's pray for those who raise their hands. So people are praying for me, over me. And if, if you may know, sometimes the older Korean generation, they can be very abusive when they pray over you, you know? <laughs> And so I remember some people were pounding my shoulder. And I'm like, I was like, ah! And they're all thinking I'm being like filled with the Holy Spirit or something. And they're going hard. They're like, more, Lord! More! Yes! Yes! Fill Eddie! Yes! I'm like, ah! You know, they're like, well, it was mixed emotions. I'm like, happy I'm saved, but I feel like I'm about to lose my arm right now. I'm dying, right? And then um, afterwards, by God's mercy, they stopped. And, but I was so excited. I remember being so excited that I was finally born again, that I knew that if I died, I was going to heaven. I had this new, like, energy. I felt like I was walking on clouds. I was so excited. And so that night, so many of my friends also became Christians for the first time, and we had this campfire of testimonies that went to, like, 2, 3 in the morning. And that morning, as it was going really late, everybody's going to sleep, and we were sleeping in tents outdoor. And I was, I was too excited to go to sleep. I was like, I'm going to heaven. How can I go to sleep right now? And I was singing. And this will show how dated I am, how old I am. Uh, one of the songs that we sang back then that was my favorite, this is called 
It was called Jesus Coming Back to Stay. Some of you may know it, right? And the chorus goes, and so praise the Lord. We're going to shout hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You're supposed to just scream amen. And so I was screaming this. Now I realize it's like 2, 3 in the morning. Outdoors, tent. Everybody's trying to sleep. And so I'm like, so praise the Lord. I'm going to have it. I'm going to shout hallelujah. Amen. And I'm like going crazy. And so all of a sudden, the, again, I'm like this little seventh grader, the youngest, shortest kid. And all of a sudden, these big, tall 12th graders, right, come in and say, hey, Eddie, we're like so glad we're saved, uh, but you know, we really need some sleep, so please, can you just shut up? <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. And then they walk out, but all of a sudden I was like, so praise the Lord, shout out, eh. And they come back, they're like, no, Eddie, we're serious. Oh, we're so glad that you're so in love with Jesus, but if you don't shut up, we're going to kill you. <laughs> so in my mind, I'm like, Okay. But then as they're walking, I'm like, and thinking, I'm like, wait a second. Even if they kill me, I'm going to heaven. So praise. And then they come back. They're really mad. And so they're, Eddie, that's it. And so they start tickling me. And I'm screaming. Red, red, ah. Real, my, my collarbone's broken. I'm, ah. And so they're thinking I'm screaming because of this tickling. I'm screaming because I'm dying because of this. My bone's broken. But at the end, I think I eventually fell asleep out of exhaustion at like 5 a.m., but we all had to get up at 6 a.m. But when the morning sunrise hit, bing, I was like, I'm going to heaven. So pretty. You know, I'm like so excited. But everybody else was pretty upset at me that morning. But I remember being so excited that I was saved. I remember being so happy I was saved. And what God was telling me as I was preparing this message was, Eddie, I miss that. I miss your crazy excitement. And I believe God is saying that to us. I miss your heart that was so excited for me when you first knew me. Remember, what were your youth group days? If you were fortunate enough to be saved when you were like in junior high school, I loved youth group days. I couldn't spend enough time at church. Car washes, lock-ins, sleepovers. But another thing I did um, in the past several weeks in preparation to this, another thing because I was like, God, I want to remember. I want to go back. What else can I do? Uh, and I started listening to some of the old or first Christian songs, CCM songs that I first listened to when I got saved. This will also show how old I am. Uh, the first Christian album I ever heard was, uh, well, the first group was Petra. Uh, they're really old school. Um, and also the first album that uh, I bought was Amy Grant's Age to Age. Some of you guys know that. It's very aged. Okay, so. Um, but one that's not so aged, uh, you know, I've been listening to these past few weeks, and sometimes as we're driving in the car, I would play some songs, and I would ask you, because I was thinking about maybe playing some of them for you, but I would, because she's never heard these songs, I'd be like, hey, Hyun, uh, does this song sound old? She's like, yes. So I was like, okay, never mind. <laughs> you know, because you know how you get used to it, and it doesn't sound old to you anymore? But a couple of songs that I just want to share with you, at least lyric-wise, are a couple of songs that really motivated me in my walk with God. One is by, uh, again, it's not as old, uh, Margaret Becker, and this song is called All I Ever Wanted. This song, from the first time I ever heard it, it drew me into prayer, and it still does, because uh, recently, the album, I think, is in uh, my parents' house in the U.S., but I downloaded it again through iTunes, and it was worth, I think, the dollar that I paid for it, uh, because it was not only reminding me so much of what I felt for God back then, but it had the same effect. It drew me to my knees again. Let me read for you just some of the lyrics. This is first lyric. It says, From where I lay, I could see the sun rising through the trees. Before I face this morning rush, I get down on my knees. I lift my eyes and I thank you for this life you've given me. I pray that every day I live, your heart will be pleased. And this is the chorus. I pray for hands that hold you higher than anything else and a heart that loves you more than life itself. This is all I ever wanted. This is all I want to be. 
This is all I ever wanted, to love you faithfully. And hearing those words and hearing the music again, it drew me to my knees again, saying, God, that's what I want. That's all I want, God, to love you more than life itself. And another person that I listened to grow, growing up with a lot was Keith Green. Any Keith Green fans, right? Uh, sadly, his uh, life ended um, in the 1970s uh, tragic plane crash, but he was prophetic and convicting. Man, any time I would hear him play a song or especially just say like two sentences between songs, I, wherever I am, I have to get on my knees and repent for something. You know, it's kind of conviction that he brought me. And one song that I want to share for you is called Make My Life a Prayer to You. These are some of the lyrics. It says, I make my life a prayer to you. I want to do what you want me to. Not with empty words, no white lies, no token prayers, no compromise. I want to shine the light you gave through your son you sent to save us from ourselves and our despair. It comforts me to know you're really there. I want to die and let you give your life to me so I might live and share the hope you gave to me, the love that set me free. And even now, it's like, I just want to repent right now. Don't you want to just repent right now? Because I wish I had this as the cry of my heart now. To love God, to die to myself so that every passion, every pore of my being would desire Christ alone. Don't you miss those days? What were the crazy days of your first love for Jesus like? I miss those days. I think God is saying to us, I miss those days. There's another show I used to watch on Saturdays called Fire by Night, which is why I like that title. It's a very God title as well. But this guy named Blaine Bartell, I don't know if anybody has seen him, he used to be one of these pump you up kind of guys, you know? Saturday afternoons, you have to be, right? So I'm like uh, eating late cereal after I watch my morning cartoons, and I'm watching this guy. He's like, Jesus died for the world. There's people on the streets right now. If you don't bring the gospel to them, how will they know? They're on the road to hell. They need you. That's why God placed you in their lives. And I'd be like, my heart would want to like pound out of my shirt. And literally there are days where I just want to run outside, find anybody and say, you need to believe in Jesus. And my friends and I used to go to the shopping malls on Saturday afternoons during high school just to talk with people about Jesus for fun. That's what we did for fun. And I miss those days. And I felt like God telling me, Eddie, I miss that heart in the church. I miss those days when love was crazy because of their love for me. Amen. Don't you miss those days? I wish so much that the church would be crazy for Christ again. So he says, remember, repent, turn, stop where you are, go back, remember what it was like, and do the things you used to do. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand, meaning he will remove our place of influence from this place unless you repent. Verse 6, yet I have this against you. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, this was another heretical group that they were causing other people to sin and compromise their faith. But notice they say, I hate the works, right? The hatred is on the sin, not the sinner. And verse 7, let's read verse 7 together. Ready to begin? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He is saying, he who has an ear, he who has spiritual ears, truly hear, truly listen. Are you really listening? Because the truly saved will respond to this love letter. Those who are truly saved, truly love God will return to him and not those who are just infatuated. And God is saying, I miss your crazy love and your crazy dreams for my kingdom. When you used to think, I'm never going to get married because I'm married to Christ. Me and my friends said that in high school and even with early college and now we're all married. 
when you would sing praises all night at the top of your lungs, not caring how poorly you sounded. And God says, I miss that. Do you miss it? Oh, how I've been praying for us. I've been praying for this weekend. I've been praying that God would restore our hearts and our love to beat and pound with a passion for his name again so that anyone who sees them, sees us, will clearly see you are a freak for Jesus. Oh, to go back to those days when all of our friends used to call us Jesus freaks. And that's a compliment, people, because they see Jesus all over your life. They see love for Jesus all over your life. Oh, to go back to the day we used to sing and seek him and love him. May we go back to those days when love for him was first. Amen? Let's pray. I want to be crazy for Christ again. How about you? What were some of the crazy things you used to do because you were simply in love with Jesus? I want to encourage you guys this week to remember, go back, download a few songs from iTunes of songs that used to trigger your love for Christ. Let's go back to being crazy for him again, shall we? Let's pray. And let's pray for that love to return with an even greater passion than before, shall we? Let's pray together.